Emily, congratulations on the new book, Mario Buada, Anatomy of a Decorator. You have a long history with Mario Buada and you've already written a book on him. So I'm curious about your connection to him and his work and what drew you to write this book in particular. I wrote the text for his first book, which came out in 2013. And I had known him just being in New York and working in the antiques industry. Um, he was um, a very prominent figure at the Winter Show. Um, he had been the chairman for decades and decades. And I worked for an English furniture gallery that exhibited there. So he was on the radar and you would see him at the opening of the show because he was such a prankster, as everybody probably knows. So he would have a dollar bill on a string and he'd be, you know, in this Opening night used to be something. Um, people would be decked out in emerald and like black tie. And, you know, and here is Mario like with a dollar on a string. And and you see people like Martha Stewart like trying to pick up the dollar and then he's just laughing uproariously. So that was how that was kind of my first introduction to him was him as a personality, not necessarily his work. But when Rizzoli asked me if I they introduced me to Mario um, to possibly write his his book with him. We got to know each other better. And I realized we both love the English country house style. We both love everything English. So we shared that connection and we spent probably every day together for a year, my just interviewing him to prepare for the book. And then I didn't know if it was a real friendship, you know, like it was, we were, you know, we would spend all day together and then he loved to go hear jazz singing, like go to cabaret and stuff. So then we'd go off to Cafe Carlisle and see Bobby Short or something like that after, after working together. And I, and I wondered kind of, okay, when the book is out, will we still be doing this together? Um, and we were, and that was, Mario was really sort of a true blue, very, very loyal friend once you were friends. So we, so we really had this friendship. And when he got ill in 2018, I was very much a, a main person around at the end. And then when he died, um, I worked with his brother to help disperse the, of the estate. So as somebody who's written about I sort of write about dead decorators. And so writing Mario's book with him, that was sort of a one-off. That's not really my interest is helping people write their books, but I thought Mario was so important and I loved what he was about. I was excited to do it. When he died, he didn't throw anything away. So everything was there. And and then that was so tough because I was the one actually cleaning everything out. And so it was so hard to throw things away because it's like, what if this is important? What if this is going to shed some incredible, I mean, I'm sure you can understand that. Like, you know, if you, it, once it's thrown away, it's gone, but you had to, because you physically couldn't even move through the space without getting rid of stuff. So to, so this book, you know, I, I felt I've, I, there's this whole journey of like selling off his things in a way to celebrate his legacy. And then this book is like the, we couldn't, there was so much stuff that I got to see for this book that we never saw for his book that we did together. And his book, the 2013 book was his story. Like if you saw him give a lecture, it's his sort of varnished, polished version of events and I would try to interview people whose um, uh, interiors were going to be in the book. And he would be like, no, you can't talk to them. Um, so he very much controlled. And I get it like that, you know, and I found that extremely frust frustrating as you would have as well. Because it's like, no, I want to tell the truth or I want to like, you know, really like dive in and show more than what people are used to seeing. But that's not what he wanted. So that's what this book is. Because I had so much to look through, but because I knew him and then I found myself feeling protective of him and like, oh, is that too much to share? Is that... So it was, it was, and it was emotional. So it was really... I. It was, it was just, it was an awful, it was an awful book to do, to be honest. <laughs> it, was, it was so complicated, but I, th I think he would love it. It's the same editor 
the same book designer who did his first book. So we all, all of us really knew him. I've really gone off the rails with your question. No, it's great. Uh, You've actually started touching on my next question. Just to make it more pointed, what is something you learned about him through sifting through all these archives that you didn't know about him before? That's an interesting question. So, so for every client, there was a folder and he would create, he learned this from John Fowler, Colfax and Fowler to create kind of a scheme board. And it, it's like a, a nine inch by 12 inch board. And for each room, you cut a little swatch of the fabrics and the carpet and the, the trims that are going to go in that room. And he would then, so it sort of shows you the whole color palette and mix of pattern and just this one concise bit. And then of course, if he needed to reorder down the road, he had this in his files. So just seeing the like, I don't know, 40, 50 boxes, banker boxes full of these and understanding how much work that he did basically alone. He had assistance, but they didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. And part of what makes um, an incredible interior designer is the attention to detail and making sure that everything is executed perfectly. And that he was able, and he was a devil in the details. I mean, let me tell you with the first book, the book that we did together, he was, he didn't have a computer. So he would read the draft out loud to me and then yell at me when he didn't like, you know, like jovially yelling at me when he didn't like something. Instead of like, if you were writing something, somebody would make some, you know, make some comments in the document, send it back to you. So we, he would read everything three times, you know, like he would just have to make sure that I actually listened to him. Um, so I think just really fully appreciating the huge amount of work that he created, that he did, the level of detail that was required. And he never wanted people to see him sweat. His personality was all about being an entertainer. But meanwhile, it's like, it made me think like, how is he going off to all these parties at night and going to jazz singers and talking on the phone for hours and hours and getting all this work done without assistance to help him? Um, so that that was kind of a, a revelation. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then I'm curious more about your process. Do you have any thoughts about the connection between the visuals and interior design and your written word? That is so interesting. Um, all of my books have been visual books. Uh, and I remember I had a book come out. Oh gosh, I can't, was it Regency Redux? And one of my closest friends said to me like, oh, you're so smart to not have so many words. And that crushed me. That really... <laughs> And I've come to understand, and because I I am a word person and a reader, um, that the captions are probably what a lot of people will read. And that's a whole other book. Like with my first books, I wanted to show everything that I talked about. And it's like, you don't have to show everything. And actually it's more powerful to have bigger pictures, like to have a double page spread that's more immersive than lots of little tiny pictures. And I remember with this, um, with this book, it was um, Pendicio Green Studio who did the book design. They're brilliant. They did a first layout and there was one page with only text on it. And the editor was like, no, you can't have like each page needs to have a picture on it. And some people, like some of my friends who also write books like this, were like, we we call a book with no pictures a real book. It's interesting. I But I do think with with things that are actually printed and published a visual book is it's something more people actually want to own whereas a real book um kindle or you know and so there is something so incredible about the tactile experience of holding a book and turning a page and all of that so i think visual books are so are so are so important and here to stay and in a way have kind of taken the place of magazines like not to be controversial but magazines just again people are happy to read them now on an ipad and there are so much they have so many challenges faced with um people just going to instagram and like creating their own little magazine by who they follow follow but these books i think have um 
have longevity and do have a, have a, a, a longer term place in libraries. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And interior design is inherently so tactile. The process of design is so tactile that there's something in there about the relationship between a design book and the experience of actually designing a space, I think. Yeah, there's the, oh my gosh, there's this book. I think it was House and Garden put it out in the 20s. And it's like House and Garden's book to color. And it's all black and white photos. And it's sort of hilarious, um, mm -hmm. you know, that is it. it, it the, the, yes, it's, it's just the photographs are so powerful. And um, some people asked, would I just write a like a, re a real proper biography of Mario? And it just like, I don't know, I don't, it, it would have been a very different animal, but you have to show, I don't know, I, I just don't think it would have been complete without it being illustrated. Yeah. You, um, the book touches on this and you, you sort of touched on this already that he had great relationships with design luminaries like John Fowler, or Sister Parrish. I'm wondering from your perspective, who are some of the living artists or designers working today that you think are going to have a similar impact and legacy? Oh, this is such a great question. So designers have to decide if they're going to be one of two things. One is the Mario path or the Madeleine Castagne path where you are known for a look and people like that look and you're identified by it. They see the room and they know it's you. And it's almost, it's like Sally Jeff, Jesse Raphael and her red glasses. You're probably too young to even know who she is, but it's just, you know, when, when Mario got the nickname, the Prince of Chintz, he immediately had a chintz suit made and like wore it to parties. So that's like one route of going. And the other one is um, like Jacques Grange, Henri Samuel, who I wrote about and others is whatever the client wants, but being able to do it on such an incredible high level. And I would say most designers, a lot of designers do that, but they're not so good at it. And that um, they're, I think for Mario, his career really took off when he just fully embraced and owned this is my look, uh, which he didn't do in the 60s. In the 60s, he was using Chrome and like whatever, you know, like they're paying him, he's going to do it. So who are those names? I think Miles Red is one of those names. I One designer who I think is incredibly talented is Stephen Sills. I mean, I think he, he may be is more under the radar like Henri Samuel was because the clients are so private and that kind of thing. Those are the two names that come to mind immediately. I know there's so many more. There's such a, oh my gosh, um, you know, people are now going to send me dead bunny rabbits or something <laughs> because of that. No, but those, those are two really good names <laughs> um, that come to mind. Mm. So minimalism has really taken center stage for a while, but there's kind of this impending pendulum swing back the other direction towards maximalism. So what makes Mario Buada's maximalist interiors relevant and impactful today? And how do you see maximalism sort of shape-shifting in the design world? Okay, I want you to answer this question, honestly, because <laughs> for me, I my taste has been baked in for a long, long time. And um, if you come visit my private gallery in the village, the walls are aubergine and chartreuse and emerald green. And I, people, are, a lot of, um, you know, younger people in their twenties, early thirties who are renting in New York, like I did back in the day with, you know, the white walls and you're like afraid to paint them. Cause what if you have to move out and you don't like, that's such a drag. They're like, oh my gosh, color. Like they just don't um, like the, the power of color, around you. People just don't think about it. For me, it's it's not going anywhere. And I think there are a lot of people like me, um, but I'm in, I'm in my like mid to late forties. And I don't know if I'm in touch with 20 year olds and 30 year olds and like what, what people are liking. I mean, there was the grand millennial term that was coined when the Mario sale happened. Sotheby's said they couldn't believe how many young people were walking through, which is sort of counterintuitive. You would think maybe a big contemporary art sale that had incredible, you know, Banksy or something would have brought, but, but that this, you know, designer whose heyday was in the eighties was bringing out so many young people. I think Mario really 
he was really ahead of his time in terms of creating a personal brand for himself around his personality, which I think a lot of us now think about, and it's kind of important to do from a business perspective. Whereas back in his day, it was kind of an anomaly. And like there's sister Parrish is famous for saying like, what's, what's he all, you know, like sheets and like, he had all these licensed lines. Like, what is he like all these parties? Like, what is he doing? Because she just wanted to go spend time with her family and her friends and work was work. But for Mario, it was every aspect of his life was connected to telegraphing what he was about because of the power of Instagram, we're all, it's, it's not just about what we wear when we leave the house. We're also thinking like, what are people seeing behind us? And that our environment is actually an extension of our fashion, our style. I do think, I hope, but I don't know if it's true that that means people do want it, are thinking about how could it be colorful like what are the things in the background? Like they're more aware of things. I also think there's a coziness and a nostalgia to Mario, to maximalism. It, it you know, grand millennials suggest grandma. And I don't think grandma is actually a diss. I think there's actually something aspirational about what our grandmothers had. Um I think I completely uh, agree. I, and there's other sort of spinoffs of that as well uh, with coastal, coastal grandmother. grandmother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We were all talking about that in May last summer. But then, like, as my friend Michael Diaz Griffith said, because I was like, "Is anyone going to buy my book?" Um, and he's like, "Well, look at the Amazon on top ten bestsellers in interior design. The covers are all beige." So I don't know. I don't know. But maybe it's like we're not the mainstream. Like it's just, but they're they're certainly a group though that is emergent and they're fashionable. You know, it isn't it isn't like they're they're retrograde and haven't gotten with the time. You said something interesting a few minutes ago. I might uh I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect of that everything Mario did was an extension of his personality in some capacity and where do you think that instinct uh to need to get that out comes from it's gosh 1982 1983 he did an interview with interview magazine and he explicitly states that um he really looked at advertising um and that with advertising you need when you have a message, you have to just stay on the message and repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Mm -hmm. And so by the early eighties, he's like, figured that out. Just like Madeline Castang had a vocabulary of colors and patterns. Um, so that when you look at a room, you're like, well, it's definitely by her, somebody who's ripping her off. Mario definitely did too. Um, and when you look, we call the first book, the Boatopedia, it's over 400 pages. But you go through and you keep seeing repeats like, oh, there's another red library. Oh, he's using, you know, there's certain fabrics he's gravitating towards. And, you know, and some people might say like, oh, he's like, he was lazy, but it's like, no, that's what his clients wanted. You know, clients, clients would see something like, I want that. So he's going to give it to them. He, everything. He never phoned it in because everything had a bajillion details from trims and cords and you, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. How would you say, aside from the personal branding aspect, the industry has changed? How different is it today versus in Mario's heyday of the 80s? In design, you don't make a lot. It's hard to make money in design. And there's also the challenge of having clients who live really well and wanting to live as well as their clients. And Mario was, you know, Mario did not grow up with a trust fund or anything like that. So he was very much self-made and he, he, in the, by the early eighties was looking to how can I, how can I use my personal brand um, to make more money? And so he dove into licensing and he said he made like his first million dollars with sheets, his sheet line. He was novel for them, but he very much, that's what everybody's doing today. Yeah, yeah. that's super interesting, the licensing component. He's switching gears a little bit. 
Um, as an art curator and decorator, how do you think about the relationship between fine art and interiors? Oh my gosh. I think they're all the same. And do we do shows at Erdman's and it could be a painting and or it could be um, hand-painted lampshades, uh, which or lamps. Um, and my whole path into what I'm doing into design history is my love of interiors uh, and I'm, you know, going to historic house museum or going to an incredible room that somebody has created with, you know, knowing it's so ephemeral, like it's not going to last unless it is in a museum. And that each part of the room is coming together to create a greater whole. So for me, that means, you know, if you go back to Louis the 14th and, you know, there's Charles Lebrun and all the ateliers, everything was considered equal. The furniture was equal to the carpets, to the painted ceiling decoration. So to me, in a way, I know this is going to be shocking. It's almost all decoration. A Rothko is decoration. So I love, but that that just means I, I love it all equally. That seems like a good definition of maximalism too that everything mm. is cool in a maximal space yeah right How right and you I define going, maximalism? yeah well that's interesting because your maximalism is is like part of the point of our conversation maximalism is about layers um well it could be about layers or it could be about multiplicity but i think it really is successful maximalism is about layering um, on, you know, things on top of things, patterns on top of patterns. And Mario would say, um, he, oh, this was a big quote of his, is if you want to learn how to design, study nature, because nature is all about the mix of patterns and colors. Nature isn't a white box. Nature, like what is naturally occurring is texture and color and all of that. In terms of applying minimalism and maximalism to rooms or spaces, I, if for, per, for personal spaces, I think it's sort of, how do you want your space to make you feel? Is it, are you looking for like a Zen monastery, serene place to be, which is really what most hotels are meant to be? Um, or are you looking for something that kind of stimulates you and charges you and like, like, you know, like gets you going? Um, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of, you know, like the world is so noisy. They want just a padded cell at home. Or I also know people are afraid, um, afraid to make decisions. I met this woman who had, she only had, um, she had four coffee table books on her coffee table and they were the same book because she was so afraid. She's like, well, I really liked it. So I got four of them because she was afraid to like, to get another, you know, she didn't know what else to get. And that is probably shocking to us, but to the person who's maybe hiring a design professional, there is fear about where, you know, about how do you even know what your taste is or what you like? Sure. That's really interesting. Do you have a dream project that you haven't worked on yet that you would love to have realized? I am actually working on my dream project right now. And, it, and it's a design project. It's um, with a very special client who I'm helping her with a new build house, not in America. And she loves Elsie DeWolf and she loves Dorothy Draper. And so we're balancing that kind of Frick Mansion meets, you know, Hollywood, our memoranda. And she, this client... It, this client is phenomenal. She's really, she's really fun and she has a great eye. So it's, it's that I can't even imagine getting another project as fun as that. Well, Emily, thank you so much. This has been so fun. I have loved it enormously. And thank you so much for, for giving me some time to talk about Mario and the book. I really appreciate it.